Hello and welcome to the fourth video in the series for the online Argon course Object Photogrammetry for Archaeology. In this video we will look into the principal function and workflow for Agisoft Metashape, the software we are going to work with. So to follow this make sure you have installed this program and activated the trial license. Metashape is quite a user friendly program with a clean and organized user interface. Working with it is very easy. But to get good and accurate results requires practice and an understanding of what each step technically means. Let's start with ensuring you're running Metashape in optimal settings. Go to Tools, Preferences, GPU tab and tick any available graphics card and hit OK. Do this only if your computer has a dedicated graphics card. I'm not sure whether your GPU will show if you have an integrated graphics card. In any case, the manual recommends not to tick this if you have an integrated graphics card. So be sure to check the specs of your machine. Additionally, you could select Use G CPU when performing GPU accelerated processing. Although this further speeds up processing, it decreases system stability, which may result in crashes. With large data sets, so with many photos, there's a big chance your budget notebook will run out of memory before the process is finished. That said, you should be able to work with the provided data set. Back to the interface. As you can see, Mine is black. Yours may be grey. This is a setting in Tools, Preferences, Theme. I find uh, dark easier on the eyes, so I choose dark. The large panel is your model viewer. The one below is where you see all the photos that are included in the project. In the left panel, you have an overview of your workspace. With the tab below you can switch to a view with all information on the scaling and statistics about errors in the data. Above is the toolbar. And above the toolbar is the menu, with some extra items that are not in the toolbar. And the most important one, the workflow. Under the workflow menu item you find all the required steps to create a model arranged in sequential order. So you start with adding photos, then you align these photos, then you build a dense point cloud, after that you generate a mesh, and finally you texture the mesh so your model regains its original, original color. There are some additional products that you do not need for object photogrammetry, but are useful for landscape photogrammetry. Steps involving the merging and alignment of chunks are important, but you will learn these in the next video. Let's start with a simple practice project. You can now follow along and pause the video whenever needed. You will find a practice photo set in the folder Laconian Kylix. You can add them through the menu. But easier still is to simply select them and drag them to the photo panel. The photos will now appear in your workspace panel on the left and in the photos panel below. Click on them to open them in the viewer window. Metashape can automatically estimate the image quality. In many datasets acquired outside, in uncontrolled settings or with low quality cameras, this is a highly relevant step. To do so, set your photos panel in Details view. Right mouse click on any photo, Estimate Image Quality. Tick all cameras and press OK. Your photos panel will now show a quality scale from zero, bad, to excellent. 1. 
Scores below 0.5 are generally considered to distort your model and thus to be excluded from the dataset by clicking the Disable or Remove buttons. The photos of this dataset all have a quality score of at least 0.6, so it is not necessary to disable any photos. To align the photos, click Workflow, Align Photos. If you are on a low-end laptop, you may need to change the accuracy to medium or low. However, with only 17 photos in the project, you might be good, even with accuracy set to high. Make sure that Generic Pre-Selection is on. Generic pre-selection will first process low-resolution copies of the photos in order to quickly find image pairs. This will speed up the process because the software does not have to compare each photo to all others. But it makes a pre-selection of pairs which will then be used for the analysis on full resolution. Leave the other settings as they are. The key points refer to the maximum number of distinctive point features on each photo. These may or may not be used to match with other photos. The tie points are a selection of key points. Tie points tie the photos together, as they represent features that are recognized on multiple photos. These are the ones used to create the model. After completion, your workspace panel will show you how many of your photos could be aligned. And you can check in the photos panel which photos have or have not been aligned. In this case, all photos have been aligned. You can also see the location of the aligned photos in the 3D view by hitting the camera button in the toolbar. You can optionally choose to show the thumbnails or just show blue rectangles for each camera. You will also see that you have generated a rough model, the sparse point cloud. These points in fact represent the tie points found on all photos. The number of them is shown at the bottom left. You can also see these points on each photo. Double click a photo and it opens in a new panel. Then select Show Points from the toolbar. These are the tie points. Some are grey, these have not been used in the computation of the model. Others have a small tail. This shows how much their location diverges from the average location of the corresponding points on other photos. Long tailed points are inaccurate points. Go back to the 3D view panel. You may have noticed that I have a grid at the background, which represents the virtual 3D space. The grid does not automatically show when you open Metashape the first time. Activate it by going to Model, Show Hide Items, Show Grid. The grid helps you to navigate 3D space better and to align and position your model correctly. This is necessary when you want to export the model and have it not hanging upside down far away from the center point when you open it in another application. The 3D navigation works as follows. Left mouse button and drag to rotate the model. Middle mouse button and drag to move the center of the view. The transparent sphere represents the center of your view which is also where the rotation centers. You can also select one of the lines on the sphere to rotate around a specific axis. The colors correspond to the Z, X or Y axis of the 3D world, also shown at the bottom right. Practice a little bit to familiarize yourself with the navigation. You can also select predefined viewpoints. This comes in handy with the next step.
what I generally like to do next is to position and align the model to the center of the grid. For this, you need to use the Move and Rotation tool in the toolbar. Mind not to select the Move or Rotate Region tool, which rotates or moves the cube around the model. What this is used for, you will learn later. In order to rotate the object correctly, I always choose one of the side views first, left, right, front or back, to set the object upright. I also change the view mode to orthographic. If you have a keypad, you can quickly switch views with the numbers associated to it, as shown in the menu. With 5, you switch between orthographic and perspective views. Now we have rotated the object correctly, we can move it to a position just above the grid. Switch to the navigation tool to check its placement. You can now go in top orthographic view to center the object. The region is the square bounding box you can see around the sparse cloud. It defines the area that the computation affects. Setting a tighter region saves some computation time for the next step. It also saves you some cleaning up of the dense point cloud afterwards. As you can see, there are quite some points that belong to the turntable, which we do not really need. With the Adjust Region tool, you can change the size and position of the bounding box, very much like the tool to rotate and move the object. Click on the Resize Region button in the toolbar and adjust its corner point so it snugly fits the object. It is again best to work with the predefined views in orthographic mode. Rotate it also to fit the object better. Ensure that the region does not cut off parts of the object, as it will be excluded from the dense cloud and the further processing of the model. To create a high resolution version of the point cloud, click on Workflow, Build Dense Cloud. For this practice run, it is sufficient to choose medium or low settings. You may choose to color the points, but if I know that I do not need a colored point cloud, as I just need a textured model as a final product, I usually deselect these because it saves some time. Depth filtering discards outliers, points that diverge strongly from their neighbors, caused by inaccurate data. It helps to remove noise from your model. Leave it at mild. Press OK to start the process. After completion, you can click on the Dense Cloud button to open the Dense Point Cloud in the Model Viewer. You see there is a lot of white noise around the rim of the Kylix, which is problematic. This noise is due to the white background. We could have prevented this by pre-masking our photos to make sure the background would not interfere. However, there is an easy way to fix it at this point as well. There are also a whole lot of points that belong to the turntable and white foam on top of it. We need to get rid of all this excess and noisy data points. The basic way to clean the dense cloud is to manually select the parts you want to get rid of with the SELECT tool, and then remove them by pressing DELETE on your keyboard. You can do this for the bottom part quite easily, by going in one of the side views and DELETE the points. 
Do not worry about the foot of the Kylix for now. You are working with an incomplete practice data set anyway. Just get rid of all the floating points. To remove the points at the rim is a bit harder. You need to be very accurate not to accidentally select parts of the actual vessel. Since the points are white and none of our object is white, we can simply select all white points. Zoom in on the white point. Go to Tools, Dense Cloud, Select by Color. Choose Select and then pick Screen Color. Select one of the white points and hit OK. Leave the tolerance at 50 and hit OK again. You will see that all white points are now pink. Hit delete on your keyboard to remove them. With the techniques just learned, try to clean up the dense point cloud as well as you can. But be careful not to delete any parts of the Kylix itself. When you feel you are ready to go to the next step, go back to the workflow and choose Build Mesh. You can leave most settings as they are. However, if you are on a slow computer, be sure to lower the face count. This is the number of faces the mesh model will be built with. The more faces, the higher the detail of your final model. Hit OK. Depending on your machine and settings, you may now have to wait a while. You can make a coffee and enjoy it while waiting for your machine to do the hard work. When finished, you can see the result by clicking the Show Mesh button. There are multiple viewing options, amongst which Solid or Wireframe. In solid view, the lighter areas are the exterior sides of the faces of the mesh. The darker areas are the interior sides of faces. All faces have an exterior and an interior side, which affects the lighting of the model. Note that in my model, due to the incomplete set of photos, the handles have turned inside out. With wireframe, you can see the actual structure of the mesh. In a way, it is the most pure and honest representation of the mesh. You can use it to inspect the detail and quality of any model. Voila, the 3D model is now finished. However, you generally want more than just a 3D shape of an object. You want to see it in its full glory, with color and Ultra HD. This is the goal of the last step, the texture building. In this step, the photos are combined to create one large image that covers the entire surface of your 3D model. Go back to Workflow and choose Build Texture. Again. The default settings are generally fine. With texture size, you choose the size in pixels of the image that is produced. And with texture count, you choose the number of images. The higher the resolution, the sharper the final texture. With very large models, it is sometimes useful to distribute the texture over several images. Enter 2048. For performance reasons, it is good practice to use textures that are a power of 2. So 1024, 2048 and 4096 are common texture sizes in 3D applications. Then hit OK. Finally. A textured 3D model. 
as you can see, it looks quite well, even if the model is incomplete. The texture, in fact, conceals many of the small distortions in the underlying mesh. It is just a CGI trick. Now you know this, don't be deceived by pretty looking models. Their mesh may just be, well, pretty much a mess. There is still one crucial step remaining, and that is the scaling of the model. Currently, the model has no scale. It can be 5 mm or 200 m tall. The scaling is done using the marker references on the photos. These markers are recognized by Metashape. To do this, go to Tools, Markers, Detect Markers. After finishing, go to the Photo panel and you will see flags have appeared on the photos. The green flags are places where the software was certain about recognizing a marker. The white ones are projected locations. To accurately scale the model, we need to help the software a bit by placing some of the white ones on their proper location. Click and drag the markers to the right location. As you can see in the overview, just 3 out of 4 markers were recognized. Not a good score. You can add the missing marker by right clicking and click Add Marker. In this case, Target 1 was not recognized. It is on the same scale bar with Target 3. So 2 and 4 belong together and 1 and 3. I have placed a marker and renamed it Target 1 in the workspace panel. Wrongly placed markers can be deleted by right clicking and select Remove Marker. Note that you do not need to place markers on each and every photo. At some point you have enough to scale the model. When you have plenty placed markers, you need to create a scale bar and tell Metashape how much distance it represents. Select marker 2 and 4, right click and select Add Scale Bar. Then do the same with marker 1 and 3. You can see the markers and scale bars in the 3D viewport if you turn on View Markers in the toolbar. Then go over to the Reference tab and you will see your scale bars added to the scale bar panel. Enter a distance of 0.15. I made sure the distance between the targets is exactly 15 cm. Then hit the Update button above. Now your model is scaled. You can measure it using the Measure tool. Isn't that fabulous? However, due to the scaling, the model is now back off center. Use the technique learned in the beginning of this video to place it back near the point zero of the 3D world.
Congratulations! You made it through your first photogrammetry project. In the next video, we're going to look at some more advanced techniques. Thank you for paying attention and see you in the next video.